to. We talk about live ball, dead ball files. Um, but we have a lot to cover, so I'm not going to be able to review a lot of the stuff we went over, so we're going to continue on. So now we're talking about handling the ball in section three of rule seven. Let me put this on here. All right. In rule two, the definition is handling the ball is transferring player possession from one player to a teammate in such a way that the ball is still in contact with the first player when it's touched by the teammate. So it's basically just a direct handoff uh, to another player. By rule, it's not called a handoff. It's called handling the ball. I guess I should turn it on, huh? All right. All right. Uh, when the rules, no player should hand the ball forward beyond the line of scrimmage, uh, referring to team A. So, we, you know, we can hand the ball the, in football, in high school, in, in the rules. Uh, the, the offense can hand the ball forward behind the line of scrimmage, right? Behind their line of scrimmage. Once they cross the line of scrimmage and go into the uh, other side, obviously the ball cannot be handed forward. Uh, after a change possession, uh, you can hand the ball forward. All right? Forward handling occurs when the runner releases the ball when the entire ball is beyond the yard line where the runner is positioned. So in other words, if I'm on the, uh, the five-yard line and we're heading out, I can hand the ball to my, on my five-yard line, my four-yard line behind me, but if I'm beyond the line of scrimmage, I can't hand the ball to the six-yard line or anybody in front of me because that is illegal, hand illegal handling. All right, exception. We're talking about behind the line of scrimmage. A lineman who has uh, clearly faces in line by moving both feet in a half turn is at least one yard behind the line when he receives the ball. Okay. So basically, we're talking about uh, you try to see, you kind of see these plays like how can a lineman. Uh, receive a, a forward handoff you know, by doing like some type of trick play you want to run, whatever the case may be. All right. If if there's a if the person is a back, if the player is a, a legal in the backfield, the quarterback can catch the ball, he can uh, run it go in motion in front of the quarterback or, and, and he can hand it off right in front of him and he can keep on going. If he's a lineman, the only way that uh, uh, the quarterback can hand the ball to a lineman, a forward handoff, if the lineman meets all three of these criteria. He must clearly, he must, so he must turn completely around. Sorry. Sorry about that. Sorry about that on me. He must clearly face his in line um, by moving both feet in a half turn. Both feet. So he can't like turn with one foot and get the ball, right? It must be both feet turned and he must be one yard off behind his line of scrimmage. So you literally have to take a step back, turn, the quarterback can hand the ball forward and then he can advance with it. That's a lot of work, obviously, right? So, you know, that you have to be able to really skill offensive line and team to be able to hold defense back until you get a ball to your offensive line. And maybe it could be a goal line play. I don't know. It's just if they want to do it, this that must be the requirement, right? I've never seen it happen before. You might see him try to hand it and hand it like this or, or just hand it in me reach over like that, but that's all illegal uh, handling the ball. The offensive lineman must complete 
have completed all three of these points to be able to get the ball. All right, a back or a teammate who is at the snap has was on an end of his line and was not the snapper nor adjacent to the snapper, all right? So a back or a teammate who can take a, a, a forward handoff is the ones on the end of the line because they're, they're eligible and anyone in the backfield, not the snapper or the guards, obviously, or anybody adjacent to the snapper, they cannot receive a forward handoff. Even so that means even if the 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 they so have a snapper and the player here on his side, let's say there's nobody on the other side of that 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 player, he can still to be on the end of the line, like like the first phase, but on the next one it says uh, not the snapper nor adjacent to the snapper, so it, it eliminates that little sneaky thing of somebody being here. Oh, he's on the end of the line. Well, he's still adjacent to the snapper, and he and he cannot get a legal forward handoff unless he do the steps that we talked about. Right. Um, any player may hand the ball backwards at any time. All right, so it doesn't make a difference when it gets down to handing the ball backwards. Any player can do it anytime. Beyond, behind, it doesn't matter as long as the person behind me. And we all seen it a lot. You can hand the ball off to a player. All right, that was it for section three on handling the ball. Very simple. Now we're going to get into fumbles and backward passes. All right, handling the ball is not a pass. A uh, loss of player possession by unsuccessful execution attempt. Of handling, of handling is a fumble. That was actually in section three, but since we're talking about fumbles and it mentioned the word fumble, I included it in section uh, four. So obviously, if I'm trying to hand the ball off and we drop the ball, don't make a difference if it's an illegal handling to the front or to the or illegal handling to the back. If it if, we, if the execution is failed, it is a fumble, which means the ball is still alive. A fumble is any loss of player possession other than by handling, passing, or legal kick, right? Loss of player possession is, is loose, is live. It can be recovered by any player uh, on the field. All right. A backwards pass is a pass thrown with its initial direction parallel with or toward the runner's end line. It simply means is that you know, if this is my parallel, anything that, it don't have to be like completely behind me, but anything other than that is considered a backwards pass. Real quick, guys, just for the sake of just knowing terminology, there's no such thing as a lateral pass in the National Federation High School rule, all right? It's either a forward pass or a backwards pass, all right? The lateral pass, which is considered to be parallel, is just called a backwards pass, right? Now, people that people might use the terminology screen pass. Screen pass is not a National Federation High School rule definition, right? So when somebody say it was a screen pass, that could mean a forward pass screen pass or a backwards pass screen pass. That doesn't mean that anything, unless it was a forward or backwards pass, that's the only two words that we should be using to describe a pass is it was backwards or forward. Uh, screen pass, whatever that means to, to anyone uh, beyond me, screen pass don't mean anything. Typically, just means it was behind, a pass thrown behind a line of scrimmage, I guess. In, in our in rules and in that's federal high school rules, there's no definition for screen pass. All right. The ball belongs to the passing and fumbling team. If a fumble or backwards pass uh, goes out of bounds between the goal line. 
So obviously, if I was the last team to possess the ball, if it goes out of bounds between the goal line, it still belongs to, to the team that fumbled the ball. Believe it or not, I, I guess in the 1920s, um, the team that last touched the ball before it went out of bounds would get possession. So that means even though A, team A fumbled the ball, if B touched the ball before it went out of bounds, B would gain possession of the ball. I was 1920. Go figure. Right. B becomes dead inbounds while no player is in possession uh, with the ball, which we don't really ever see happen. Obviously, the rule says that if a ball, if a loose ball is is motionless and no no players try to gain possession of it, the ball is dead and it belongs to the team that uh, fumbled it. Obviously, that may happen like on a scrimmage kick down or a punt. Um, you know, the, the receiver trying to stay away from it because they don't want to touch it, and then the other team trying to get the ball. Um, literally, no one has to touch the ball. Even K don't have to touch the ball for the down, the down end. Once the ball becomes motionless and no one's trying to get it, uh, the referee, or the game, the covering game official, can blow the ball dead. All right. Becomes dead inbounds while opponents are in joint possession. Remember, anytime there's a joint possession, the ball immediately becomes dead and belongs to uh, the, the, the team that lost possession of the ball, right? Team A, or if it's team A, right? So just know that we don't, there's no fighting for a loose ball, obviously. Uh, so the covering official, if you actually see who has possession of the ball, uh, when you blow the whistle, although there might be a pile on, just know, hey, I've seen it was a joint possession. Don't make a difference who comes up with the ball. This is not the NFL. So if you see a joint possession, the ball is dead immediately, and it belongs to that team. You don't have to be like, oh, no, let me see, let me see, let me see. It doesn't matter. It's a joint possession if his ball is dead immediately, and it belongs to A fumble or backwards, um, I can't see that. Hold on. A fumble or backwards pass is caught or recovered by any player he may uh, advance it, I believe it says there. I got a lot of things on my screen, so I can't see everything that says there. But um a fumble back recovered by any player, they may advance it, right? If a fumble or backwards pass is out of bounds behind a goal line, the ball belongs to the team defending the goal, and the result is either or either a touchback or safety. Okay. Again, next week in Rule Eight, we talk about a, a terminology called new force. Uh, so it has a a lot of variables on a ball that goes out of bounds behind the goal line. Uh, and hopefully we may get into that and describe it no more unless we get into our in-depth course next time. If the ball goes out of bounds behind the goal line, it's going to be a touch, it's going to be a touchback or a safety. Obviously, if it's possessed by the opponent, it's always a touchdown. Uh, but if it goes out of bounds in nobody's possession, we'll be looking at a touchback or a safety. All right. That's it for section four of fumbles and backwards passes. The reason why they both go together, and let me mention this real quick. Obviously, a backwards pass is a live ball, uh, live ball. So if I throw a backwards pass, I mean either parallel or my, uh, my, uh, my, my inline, and it hits the ground, that ball is live. Anybody can recover it and advance it, okay? If it goes forward, it's incomplete and the ball is dead. Now, real quick, because again, um, I have coaches mention this all the time, or youth coaches, anyways. They think that a four pass, or you may call it a screen pass, if it's thrown behind the line of scrimmage and it hits the ground, the ball must remain alive. No, 
And that's why we don't use the terminology screen pass. Because if I throw a pass behind the line of scrimmage and it's a forward pass and hits the ground, it's incomplete. It's dead. There's no recovery. That ball is not live, right? It has to be either parallel or behind. And also, a fumble, all those balls are live and they may be in bad, right? So, forward pass classification. Look at some definitions real fast. Real fast. Passing the ball is throwing uh, a ball that is player that is player possession. In a pass, the ball travels in flight. All right. So basically, I got in my possession and I released the ball in flight. That is considered what they call passing the ball. All right. A forward pass is a pass thrown with its initial direction toward the opponent's end line. So basically, if it's not going parallel or to my inline, it's considered a forward pass. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be a direct forward pass. Again, if I had a little line and this was considered parallel, anything this way is considered a forward pass. From here, that way is a forward pass. So it doesn't have to necessarily be this way. If I go like this, I'm going up. up 45 degree angle in front, that's considered a forward pass if it hits the ground, it's incomplete. Right? A forward pass has gone beyond the neutral zone if at any time during the pass, the entire ball is beyond the neutral zone. Obviously, that's a definition. I don't see none of us like saying, let me see. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's crossed. Yeah, yeah, whatever. It's thrown. <laughs> it's beyond the neutral zone. We're we're not trying to like gauge it and say, oh no, that wasn't necessary. But I don't know why they have a definition, but hey, that's a definition. All right. It is a legal forward pass. A player of A throws the ball with both feet of the passer in or behind the neutral zone when the ball is released. Full stop. That's it. Don't add no more to that. There's five things that talks about what is an illegal forward pass, and we're going to talk about that. But here, when they talk about a legal forward pass, a legal forward pass is when a player, when a passer throws the ball and his feet are in or behind the neutral zone. So one of the things I, I do, I continually do it to this day. And, uh, I think a, a couple of seasons I did it uh, more often. A lot of times I get, you know, I can tell, hey, you want to become a ref or you want to become a game official? I get game officials telling me, oh, I know the rules. I know the rules. And I normally had three asset tests, three asset questions that I would ask, right? And it wasn't to um make them look bad but it was more to say see you thought you knew the rules so it, it you know just because you you um you've been officiating for 20 years don't mean you know the rules right um i didn't put the quote in here but if you go on our on our um website on the training um there's a quote from confucius that says Knowledge without practice is useless. So that means that, let's say, you know, this is considered knowledge. If you're not putting this to work or getting no experience, it's useless, right? It's no good. But the next part of that quote says, practice without knowledge is dangerous. All right? Which raise the bar and the elevation. Right, useless and dangerous. Right? So basically, in our in our uh, content here, an official with experience but no knowledge, no education of the rules is dangerous. Right? If all you do is get this knowledge and you never go out there and use it, it's useless to you. Right? You can't do nothing with it. 
But if you go out there and officiate but didn't have the training, you're dangerous. And there's a lot of dangerous officials out there because they think they know the rules, but they don't. They never spent time in the rule book. Never, ever read the rule book. They just let people tell them the rules or they assume they know what the rules are. And if you know anything about me, this really ticks me off. But anyways, I digress. The three questions that I ask an official on an acid test, just to gauge the knowledge and just let them know, see, there's more to, uh, to the rules than what you, you think. One of the rules, one of the questions I ask is the question I ask you guys. Can a passer cross the line of scrimmage, retreat back behind the line, the, the line of scrimmage, and then throw a forward pass? All right? So, I would say I've been asked this question for at least over eight years. The same question I'm asking right now. And yet, to this day, people get it wrong. I mean, I'm not doing my job. Other trainers and assigners not doing their jobs. Because even today, people's getting that answer incorrect. So looking at the definition that right here, is a legal forward pass, a legal forward pass, a player A throws the ball with both feet of the passer in or behind the neutral zone. In the, um, in the football rules book, uh, rules by topic, Look right here, I've been um, reading this book as, as a supplement book to my rules for years now. And this is I actually read this and I saw this and I'm like, I didn't even think about it, but I'm like, oh, wow. This is what it says in simple terms. The passer may cross the line of scrimmage, retreat behind the line of scrimmage, and throw a pass as long as both feet are behind the line when the pass is thrown. Full stop. So you got to ask yourself, if you thought that this was a foul, why you thought it was a foul? Why? You couldn't have read it in the rule book because it don't say it. So it had to be an assumption or you may be thinking about uh, another type of football like NFL or NCAA, but you wasn't thinking NFHS. Again, this is the problem that we have is because a lot of people who become officials think they know it all because they watch football on TV, and then they bring that fragment, fragmented rule knowledge to their officiating and they're dangerous, All right? They're dangerous, All right? I normally say it like this, and that, it doesn't matter where the passer been, but where he's at when he throws the ball, All right? So if you wanna hypothetically pass out some hypothetical uh, scenario, right? I pitched the ball back to a halfback who runs as he crossed the line of scrimmage of the neutral zone, he's about to be tackled. He turns around and throw a backwards pass back to another uh, back or the original quarterback, whatever. Then the quarterback takes the ball and throw it for a pass, legal. Because he's behind, in or behind the neutral zone when the pass is thrown. All right. I can run, I can scramble to my left, scramble to my right, I can cross the line of scrimmage, I can scramble by, and I can still throw a forward pass. As long as when I release the ball, I'm in or behind the neutral zone when the ball is released. All right. So if I ever ask you that question, 
You know the answer. Yes, it is legal. All right, that's enough on that, my soapbox. All right, the offensive of team, team A, is divided into two classifications on a legal four pass. Eligible receiver and ineligible receiver. We're going to look at the ineligible receiver first. Team A will always have a minimum of five ineligible players slash receivers on a legal forward path, right? So there will always be five ineligibles on team A during a pass, right? We're, you, we identify them by the uniform number, which is basically uh, – and their offensive position, all right? And we already read this, we already looked at this last week, but I'm bringing it here. At the snap, at least five A players on their line of scrimmage must be number 50 through 79. Basically, uniform number is 50 through 79. Anybody wearing 50 through 79 is automatically considered an ineligible receiver. They can't be a running back and get a handoff. Not saying you can't hand the ball to the forward if their position is a legal back. But when it gets down to a forward pass, they're considered an ineligible receiver and can't be downfield when a pass is thrown. And go past the expanded neutral zone. We'll look at that. So 50 through 79, and all their position, we're going to look at offensive position. Now, let's talk. This is high school football. Let's talk youth football. In youth football, I can show you many pictures of 14 snapping the ball, uh, 24 as a tackle, uh, 50, you know, all kind of oddball numbers on the line. And it makes it very difficult for game officials to determine who's ineligible because we have to know who's ineligible players are. So that means like every down the somebody has to be writing down the numbers of the players who's on the line. So we, so the ball is passed. We we'll know we had an ineligible downfield. And that's the reason why in, in the national federal high school, it specifies that to help game officials know who's ineligible. They'll be weighing these particular numbers. Right. So what, we, what can we do in youth football to help with that? Well, in my experience, I worked on some games in Pasco County before. And in their youth program, they made the eligible receivers wear two white uh, sweatbands on their wrist so we didn't know who's eligible. You can reverse that. You can put two white wristbands on your ineligible receivers so we so, – Game officials can know. I, I'm I know I'm talking to you guys. I, I doubt anybody in Mid Florida is going to take that suggestion. So we just do it. Just continue on doing what we're doing. If we can catch it, catch it. If we can't, we can't. All right. Ineligible by position. A team A player who are between the ends, which we call covered up, on their line of scrimmage. They are ineligible. They are ineligible no matter what number they're wearing. If they're covered up on the line, they're ineligible receivers. All right. This may cause a receiver who has an eligible number to become ineligible by position at the snap. So, key word there at the snap, right? So, if like we talked about last week about shifting. So I may be covered up, but then if we do a, a, a shift and I'm not covered no more, then it's fine. So let's say I'm a tight end and I got a, a wide out and he's on the line too and I'm covered up. That means I'm ineligible to go out for a pass. But let's say he takes a step back. That changes everything. Now I'm on the end of the line. And now I'm eligible to go out for a four pass. Okay. So if that's the 
Now I'm covered up. Although I may have an, an, an eligible number, I'm still ineligible because of position. All right, look at this. Um, you see the tight end right there is covered up. You got a, a, a slot guy off, and then you got somebody on the line. That, that what it means by being covered up on the line. You got somebody on your outside that um, is now in, uh, outside of my line. That makes me, I'm ineligible. As we, um, being officials, we got to spot that, right? And typically, I may, you know, make a note. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Tight end covered up. Number five or number twelve or eighty-nine, whatever his number is. He, if it's a, if it becomes a pass play, I'm going to have a flag of ineligible downfield. You can you can see they're pretty much ready to do a. It look like a pass play anyway. So as a game official, did we really got to pay attention to that? All right, the, and the covering official on, on his side will see that. The other official on the other side, other wing official probably won't notice that, but the covering uh, the, uh, official will. Even at a bike judge, the bike judge, if you don't see you punching back, he may see that he might be an ineligible receiver, but the covering wing official, that's your call and, and to make. So let's make sure we, we see that. Again, if you look at this right here, uh, the inside receiver uh, is on the line, which means he's covered up and is an ineligible receiver. In youth football, when I see this, I automatically know it's a run play. Most coaches would put him somewhere. I mean, oh, it's going to be a run play. They're just trying to just draw people off. Most likely, they're going to run to the right, right? Because if you count, that's 11 players right there. I, I didn't count the defense. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. Okay, so all the defense is on this side too, right? So that means if he snaps the ball and hands it off, there's nobody on the right side immediately to tackle him. So that could be a deception play that it looks like it's going to be a pass play, but most likely could turn to a run play. For example, the, the, um, the slot guy, he can go in motion, take the snap, and run. But in order to make this legal, the outside guy will have to go to the other side. And if he goes to the other side, that makes that receiver eligible. But again, most likely this is a, a deception um, formation because they're going to be running to the other side, so nobody's going to be over there uh, to stop that runner. And he may, he may get a first down. All right. Ineligible by illegal position. Now, I'll be honest with you. No one really calls this. I'm going to talk about it because I'm teaching you the rules. I'm not going to neglect to teach you the rules because it's, it's not really called, right? I'm going to teach you the rules and you make your own decision if you want to call this or not. My position is rather than not calling it, how about we just educate coaches and teams on what is legal versus not educating them and then what's illegal now becomes legal. Whatever. All right, a bike in an illegal position, which is considered no man's land or limbo. This may create an eligible receiver by number becoming ineligible by, by illegal position at the snap. Again, if he readjusts himself, it's legal. If he doesn't readjust himself, it's illegal. And we already talked about, I'm gonna show you again right here, Number 25 is in a limbo position, and because he's in an illegal position, he's not considered a legal back, so he's now an ineligible receiver by position. You see this in college, NFL, even in high school. That slot guy 
is breaking the waistline of a teammate pretty much all the time. When you go to clinics, they say, give him the credit, he's off the line. Although he's not in true position like 16 is, um, 25 is breaking 36 and 82 waistline. So he's really in an illegal position. So he's not legally eligible to go out for a forward pass. But again, it's really not called. So you do it what you want to do with it, but now you know. All right. Ineligible receiver restrictions. May not advance beyond the expanded neutral zone before a legal forward pass has crossed the neutral zone in flight. Okay. So What's the expanded neutral zone? The neutral zone may be expanded following the snap up to a maximum of two yards behind the defensive line of scrimmage in the field of play during a scrimmage down, All right? So remember, the neutral zone, we got two lines of scrimmage. We got the offensive line of scrimmage and the defense line of scrimmage. The, the uh, alignment, our illegal receiver can't go no more than two yards be considered eat, um, he'd be considered ineligible downfield, even if he doesn't make contact with anyone. Now, this is in a case book. Again, would this be called? I seriously doubt it. But in the case book, it talks about a lineman. He goes up three yards, don't see anyone, so he goes by behind the line of scrimmage. And then a pass is thrown. You still have a foul for ineligible downfield because during the down, he went more than two yards behind the defense line of scrimmage. Again, would anybody call that? Because nobody even knows, really. Probably not, right? But again, now you know. All right, the next one. May not bat, bump, or catch a, a legal forward pass. It doesn't make a difference if the pass is behind the line of scrimmage, in the neutral zone, obviously beyond the neutral zone. If, if a legal forward pass is thrown, a receiver, an eligible receiver by number or by position, may not bat, muff, or catch a legal forward pass. So this is what we consider an intentional act. It's not saying it can't hit him in the back. But to bat something, you intentionally knock the ball down. To muff it, it means you intentionally try to secure it, but you fail. Catch means you did catch possession of it. All those are intentional acts, and all of those are what we call a, a illegal touching. All right? Illegal touching. Not to be confused with first touching on kicks. Illegal touching is when an ineligible receiver bats, muff, or catch a legal forward pass. All right. Restrictions are terminated. So we, we say he can't bat, muff, or catch. Um, we say he can't go beyond to expand the neutral zone. Those restrictions are terminated. Um, if B touches the uh, on ineligible downfield, if B touches the pass in or behind the neutral zone, very important, right? If I'm if I'm in, if I'm in ineligible and I'm illegally downfield, and it touches a B player down there, well, I'm already legal, but I want I want to be no more than two yards anyway. So that's irrelevant. It's just talking about, but in or behind the neutral zone. Yeah, I can go out now. If I, if I see you get touched, I can run and I can go catch it if I'm an ineligible receiver. All right. Illegal touching after B was first to touch the ball. Okay. So again, I don't make it there. If a player downfield touches the bat and it come back to me, um, it is no longer illegal touching because it was first touched by B, not by A guys, but by B. So it's still illegal touching, 
if even if that's one of my an elder receiver, then I try to catch it. Right. All right. All A players become eligible when B touches a legal four pack. Right. So although there's five A players, 50 through 79, that are ineligible receivers, can't be downfield, can't touch the ball. Once B touched the ball, all bets are off, and anyone on A is now becoming eligible receiver. All right, now look at eligible receivers. Team A can only have a total of six eligible receivers on a legal four pack. 11 players on the team, so track five is ineligible, leaves you six. Go figure. All right, so six eligible receivers. Uniform numbers, one through 49 or 80 through 99, right? Zero is the illegal number in the National Federation High School, right? Or by position, all right, one, a player on the ends of their scrimmage line are eligible receivers. And a player, see right here, eight players legally behind the line. Legally. So when we talk about that limbo player, if he don't meet the definition of what it means to be a legally behind his line, he's in an illegal position and he becomes ineligible. Just saying. All B players are eligible receivers. So on any pass play, you have a total of 17 eligible receivers, 11 on defense and six on offense. So <laughs> in my research, I was trying to find plays that was covered up. And I, I ran across this picture. And I know we talked about illegal um Deception plays about, you know, any play where a team make any verbal or nonverbal uh, indications that there's a problem with the ball and they snap the ball, that's illegal. And that's an unsportsmanlike conduct. But on this play here, this is a play of deception formation. And let's see if this formation is legal. Now, we already talked about what our ineligible receivers have to do. We talked about, like, there has to be at least five people on the line of scrimmage that has 50 through 79. There only could be four uh, eligible receivers in the backfield, and only those on their ends are eligible. So if you see here, the indication that this guy is actually a tight end, he's in a tackle slot, all right? He's in a tackle slot, but his number is eligible, all right? And then the guy on the right side of the screen, 74, is a, by number is illegal, but he's in a legal position. And so let's remember guy we talked about that limbo. The number, the guy right to the right of him, he like he's on the line too, but he's actually off. And the guy to the left of him, he like he's breaking the waistline of a lineman, but he's considered off too. Most again, most officials don't care about that limbo definition, but it is what it is. Let's look at another slide. All right. Be five linemen, 50 through 79 on the line. So, not the, not the, where the arrow is pointing to that tight that that tight end tackle. We got one, two, three, four, and then number five is enough. Is 74. So so far so good. They meet the requirement of having five players on the line of scrimmage, 50 through 79. They're good there. Four bikes. We got the one to the far left, the one to the slot, 
The quarterback is considered a back. He's number three. And then we have uh, number four. I'm sorry. A guy on the right is, is, is on the line. I'm so sorry. But number four, uh, he's a back. So we got no more than four in the backfield. We're covered there. Been, we have six eligible A receivers. No more than six. A total of six. So we got the one on the out, the, the slot two. Listen, guys, to be your eligible view on the end of your line of scrimmage, this guy is actually on the end. So he's on the end, and he has an eligible number. So he's technically, by rule, an eligible receiver. Then we got number four, the quarterback, the slot receiver, and then the other guy on the outside end, he's um, an eligible receiver, all right? So far, so good. Now, the, 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 obviously the ideal here is to draw coverage away from one of the eligible receivers. So, I'm sorry, hold on, I'm backwards there. So, and the number one guy, he's pulling, he's pulling this guy over here to cover him. Number two got this guy covered, plus there's a, there's a safety out, uh, a safety out there. He's got him covered. Number five, he got, he got somebody uh, zoning on him. And then number six, he has covered. But look at this. This is an ineligible receiver, not only by number, but by position that he's covered up. And he got coverage. This guy is covering him. Which leaves three spot all to himself. Hold on for a minute. I got the video, but I'm going to have to share my screen. Let's hope I don't make no mistakes when I do this. Let's, right, so I'm sharing you guys, hold on, give me a second. I tell you what, I'm trying to do too much here, guys. Give me a second. I want to show you all this. Oh, let me. Oh, I know what I'm doing. X out of this first. This. Let me draw this over here. Yeah, and y'all see. Um, Give me a thumbs up if you see this play with the with the um thing down here. I'm about to hit a play. Am I sharing that screen with you guys? I can't see it. Okay, now. Yes, there's two plays up. All right, cool. So this is the play right here, guys. You see them come out, they're going to go into a standard formation, then they're going to shift. Now defense is shifting with them, and they try to figure out who to cover. 23 runs up on an ineligible receiver. The ball is snapped. Look at that tight end all by himself. Got a catch. They're going to show it one more time. Now there is a foul. There was, college is not going to call it. But there is a foul in that play. All right. Do anybody know what foul was on that play? Anyone know? It was a legal shift. Nobody was set for more than one second. Right? I mean, they shifted, and before they can um, 
get back in position okay before they get back in position the ball will snap so do everybody see where it says what does it mean to be eligible making sure i got everybody on the right screen thumbs up Do everybody see the screen that says, let me see, sure. Yeah, y'all see it. Okay. So let's move forward. Just making sure we're all on the same page. All right. So what does it mean to be eligible? Again, uh, I lied because in the rule book and definition, it tells you every definition there is, but it's actually in the rule book, rule two, and I looked like three or four times, I don't want to be calling myself being called a liar or misinformed. The rule book don't define an eligible receiver or an ineligible receiver. It talks about what a passer is, what a back is, what a lineman is, what a kicker is, what a defensive player is, what a snapper, ineligible substitute, I mean, substitute is, but it don't tell you a definition for an eligible receiver. So I have to go to Google. Found this in Google. Having the right to do or obtain something. And I actually also found this on Google under eligible. I'm oh, sorry, not that one. This one. Permitted under football rules to catch a forward pass. That was actually on Google. So an eligible, someone who's eligible has the right to and permitted under football rules to catch a four pack. So obviously, if you're ineligible, you don't have that right. All right. So remember we read that an ineligible can't bat, muff, or catch a pass, which means an eligible can bat, an eligible can muff, or an eligible has, is permitted to catch the ball. All right. All that is what it means to be an eligible receiver. But remember, what, we got 11 defensive players if they got everybody on the field, 11 B players that's eligible, and we only have six A players. Which means we're going to run into a problem because they all have a right to the ball. Six and 11. Which sometimes we may run into for pass interference, right? So it is a four pass interference that any A, any player of A or B who interferes with an eligible who have the right to opponents to move toward the ball, catch the ball, or bat the pass, right? Move toward the pass, catch the pass, or bat the pass. That word interferes is subjective, guys. I mean, I'm going to try to find it, what, what it means to interfere later uh, in, this, in this course, the class, but interferes. Now, in my younger days, I have thrown pass interference on defenders who get in front of an eligible receiver it slows down intentionally to prevent him from catching a forward pass. Hey, if I can't move toward it, it says right here, it's interference. I don't know if I call it they, but anyways, I used to call that. Why? I, can, I clearly see that the B player is not making no bona fide attempt for the ball. All I'm trying to do is prevent him from getting to the ball, and he does it by slowing him down. So it says, hey, not giving me an opportunity to move toward the ball. So I could be wrong. All right. Pass interference restrictions only apply to a forward pass. All right. So um, there's more to that, honestly, but let's see. Beyond the neutral zone. Okay. So if the ball don't go beyond the neutral zone, the pass interference restrictions do not apply. So technically, if I'm throwing a screen pass, be it forward or backward, 
behind the line of scrimmage. And that defender moves up and push and, and knocks the other guy out of the way to catch the ball. That's not pass interference, right? Because the contact happened behind the line of scrimmage, behind the neutral zone, right? Only applies to balls beyond the neutral zone. On, only on legal forward passes. So we're going to talk about what is the illegal four pass later. But if it's if I'm throwing an illegal four pass, pass interference restrictions don't matter. Now, this is the thing. If I'm a bike judge or if you're a bike judge, you may still throw a flag for pass interference because you don't know that an illegal four pass was thrown. You better not know. You should be doing your job. If you know that, you're not doing your job. So a covering official, even a wingman, let's say three-man mechanics, you're following the play down the field, the pass is thrown, you may throw a flag for pass interference, but it could have been uh, an illegal for a pass. That's what the other officials have to let you know, and then all of are going to blow up, they'll get mad at you, but if we picked up their flag, we have another flag for illegal for a pass, and you know how that goes. But anyway, it only applies to a legal four pass. So you can't have no pass interference. And it also applies, it, it only applies if the ball is untouched by B in or behind the neutral zone, and then the ball crosses the neutral zone. So in other words, if B tips the ball in or behind the neutral zone, pass interference down the field does not apply. You still may throw a, a flag for pass interference. But when we find out the ball was touched by, by B before it ended up behind the neutral zone, whatever contact happened down there is not considered for a pass interference. Okay. You might, want, you might have illegal use of the hands, you may have holding, but you're not going to have pass interference. Not saying you can't have a foul. You just can't have a for pass interference foul. Okay. Don't mean it's free play. Just means not that foul. Sorry. Pass interference restrictions on a legal forward pass begins for A at the snap. Why? Because you know the, you know what you're gonna run. You already know the play. So because you know the play and you know where the ball is gonna be thrown at the snap. Pass interference restrictions. You can't be pushing off of nobody to clear somebody away so you can catch the ball because you know the pass is coming to you. B, when the ball leaves the passer's hand, it doesn't say when it crosses the neutral zone. It says when the pass leaves, when the ball leaves the passer's hand. Black judge is not looking at the passer's hand, obviously, but that's the rule, right? All right, pass interference restrictions are in effect for all A and B players until the ball is touched or the pass is incomplete. So in other words, the ball is coming, I reach up, I muff the ball, obviously pass restrictions are over. Not contact of a defenseless player is over. Pass interference restrictions are over, all right? Again. Just because we can't call pass interference, no, can't mean we can't uh, throw a foul or contact of a player because the receiver falls in that category. All right. This is not a four pass interference. Unavoidable contact occurs when two or more eligible are making a simultaneously bona fide attempt to move toward, catch, or back to pass. All right. So obviously, where two people are trying to trying to uh, converge on the same geographical area, uh, they're going to be contact made. But if they're both making bona fide attempts for the ball. 
is not pass interference. Even if they trip, even if one trip over the other, like I'm looking up, he's looking up, and we trip entangled feet, <laughs> although it looks really bad, it's not pass interference. Right? It's not an intentional trip. It's just an accidental contact with two people actually going for the ball. Contact by A is immediately made on a B lineman, and the contact does not continue beyond the expanded neutral zone. So a lineman makes contact. I can push you back. I can't go more than two yards. If I go more than two yards, we have a whole other scenario. But typically on a pass play, uh, the, by, I don't want to see them driving too much anyways. Coach try to prevent them from doing too much driving on a pass play. But um, teammates contact and don't go more than two yards is not pass play. And so the last one, contact by B is obviously away from the direction of the pass, all right? So if I'm throwing over there and we got B contact over here, not considered passing the band. Then say it can't be illegal use of the hands. I'm just saying it can't be passing the Can't say it's not be holding. It's just not. Okay. All right. So let's reverse engineer what we read, right? So if this right here is not pass interference, how can we make that pass interference? Right? So we read, I'm going to tell you how we have to, you know, it says we read earlier that pass interference when somebody interferes, and I said that's kind of subjective. So if this is not pass interference, let's re-engineer it to make it pass interference. All right, so if we reverse engineer this, contact occurs without an attempt to move toward the ball, catch or bat the pass by two or more eligible receivers. So if I'm playing, if I'm, not, if I'm focused on the eligible receiver, rather than me focusing on the ball, that can be interpreted as pass interference. Because I'm trying to stop him from catching the ball. And so I'm going to interfere, grab him, hold him, push him, keep his hand down from catching the ball. That becomes pass interference. Contact by A or B lineman continues beyond the expanded neutral zone. So I'm making contact with a B player, and I push him three yards, and then the ball is thrown, that can be considered a forward pass interference. And three, contact by B is in the direction of the pass. Guys, there's no rule, there's no such thing as an uncatchable pass rule in the National Federation High School rules. It doesn't make a difference if the pass is 10 yards above his head. The ball is coming toward me, and a defender, or B, or I, it could be A on B, whatever. If I interfere with him moving toward the bat or to catch the pass, and I make contact with him, it is pass interference. Because if that's not catchable, doesn't make a difference, right? The ball left the passer's hand, it's thrown in his direction, you made contact, you're not trying to go for the ball. Okay. All right, this rule has changed. Remember, face guarding used to be a pass interference, but no longer. Face guarding, and you see that keyword there in parentheses, without contact, in and of itself, no longer consider an act of forward pass interference without contact. Obviously, if there is contact, you got pass interference. All right. So there is a file unique to the National Federal High School Group. All right. This file contains 
This foul is a 30-yard foul. All right? So in other words, there's, there's, there's one foul in the National Federation High School rule. You know, I never made this part of my asset test when people say I know the rules, which I guess I could add it because a lot of people don't know this. But there is one foul that you can have a 30-yard penalty. One foul. And that's the intentional pass interference foul. Intentional pass interference foul, it comes with a loss of 15 yards from the previous spot and additional 15 yards from the succeeding spot. So that means right where you're going to snap the ball at after you do the 15, you add another 15 yards. All right, so a foul outside the 45 yard line will result in a 30 yard penalty. You can find that in the rule book on the table seven five. So let's talk. You rarely see this ever called. All right. I've called it, and I'm gonna tell you why. It was against one of the teams in mid-Florida. And the reason why I had to call this, because they were intentionally uh, trying to intimidate other players. So it was a pass play, and he intentionally, I mean, just slammed into the receiver, not even remotely trying to go for the ball, right? I call it intentional pass interference, and they got a 30-yard uh, uh, penalty on that. The other team was crazy. They went ballistic. But that's not football. What are you talking about? I'm like, well, it is. In, 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 in the, that's, the, that's the rules. We can do that. But I tell you what, gauge it by your gut, right? I mean, obviously, pass interference is somewhat intentional no matter what. Um, so, but if it's a, you know, I guess minor intentional, you know, you don't really call it. Then nobody ever really called this, but it can be called. Um, but very rare, like a unicorn. But my job is to teach you the rules, right? That's all I'm doing. Whatever you do with it is, is on you because if you do call it intentional pass interference, you're not wrong. It's in the rules. You got to use your judgment and experience, the game situation, the, the severity of the, of the um, foul, put all those things into the bucket, mix it up, and then you can say intentional or just regular pass interference, right? But again, if you, but if you never call it, ain't nobody going to know. Ain't no coach going to run to somebody, that was intentional pass interference, unless they've been to my class. <laughs> that was intentional pass interference. I want my fit, all additional 15 yards. They're going to be like, okay, you have 15 yards, right? Only time they will get upset is when you do call a, an intentional pass interference and you give them 30 yards, they're going to be like, what the hell? But yeah. So I might, I might include that into my asset test on what foul can give you a 30 yard penalty. Guys, remember, testing is coming soon. All right, let's talk about illegal forward passes. A pass from beyond the neutral zone. Obviously, the legal forward pass, the pass behind or in the neutral zone, it only beckons reverse engineer it, right? A pass from beyond the neutral zone would be an illegal forward pass. A pass after team possession has changed during the down. Obviously, if you intercept the ball or a kickoff, you can't throw no, there's no pass, no forward passes allowed. Backwards passes all you want, but no forward pass. A second or subsequent forward pass thrown during a down. Another true fight. That rule just was introduced over the last five years. When I first started officiating, you can throw multiple forward passes. And people didn't know that either. I did a game, and they throw two forward passes. And, man, they went ballistic. I said, well, that's legal. 
Well, back then it was, oh my God, no, it's not that about football. You don't know football. Man. You just don't know the rules. Now you can't do it, but before, I think about five, six years ago, it was legal. A pass intentionally thrown into an area not occupied by an eligible offensive receiver. Not an eligible receiver, that could be a defensive player, but an eligible offensive receiver. So, intentional grounding, right? Guys, there's no such thing as a tackle box in high school football. And that's your favorite high school rule, should I say. There's no such thing. If the defense drive you back, they are they get all that, they get what they earn. And you cannot throw away the ball to not prevent them from earning what they got by driving you backwards, right? You got to take the sack. So uh, you can't throw away a ball. You got to throw it to an eligible receiver. That means if you try to throw it to a lineman, you're going to have illegal touching and you're going to have illegal uh, forward pass, intentional ground. You have two fouls and you get to pick one. A pass intentionally thrown incomplete to save a uh, loss of yardage or conserve time. Um, now, obviously, the exception to that is that a player um, is, is allowed, who, who's lined up to receive a snap, is allowed to throw the ball, take the snap and throw the ball directly to the ground to stop the clock. However, if he muffs it or the ball hits the ground first, so if I catch it and I muffed it, I can't then get possession. It has to be a, a, a clear catch, throw, can't be a muff, and it can't hit the ground. If I do it, it, I, it becomes intentional grounding. All right? All right. So an illegal forward pass is a foul. Ooh, it is. It is. All right. The measurement is from the spot. So it's a spot foul. So in other words, if I go by 10 yards and I throw intentional grounding, it's not the NFL, guys. The spot of where I threw it is the spot foul, and I get to mark off the penalty from that spot. It'll be another five yards. It'll be a 15-yard penalty, a 15-yard bite, because I, wherever I threw it at, that's the measurement spot. Obviously, if I cross the line of scrimmage, to be honest, if I throw it, obviously, it's going to be where I threw it at. But even behind the line of scrimmage. Where you throw it at is where you throw it, where, where um, it's measured from. All right, the offended team can decline the distance penalty. Don't know why, but they decline it. The rule is you can decline anything you want. You don't have to accept it. I don't know why, but you can decline it. Um, and they can still choose the down account, obviously. It's going to be a loss of down. Or accept the action determined by the catch. So if they intercept the ball, they can say, oh, no, 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 we, we want to take the ball. Even though it was an illegal four pass, we caught it. We want to keep the ball and keep the action of the ball, right? And we're almost done here. All right, so a four pass, legal or illegal? So if a pass is thrown, don't make a difference if it's legal or illegal, if it applies the same. It may be advanced when caught by any uh, player A or B, right? There's a live ball foul. Uh, or a live ball, period. So any player, even if an ineligible player catches the ball, it's still live, right? Anybody can advance it. We'll just have to deal with everything afterwards. All right. If the pass is caught simultaneously by two opponents, the ball becomes dead. So the first one is telling you, don't blow the whistle to kill a live ball foul or whatever, because it was caught by B or A or Eagle Four Pass, it's still a live ball. But if it's simultaneously caught by opponents, again, guys, anytime you see the word simultaneously by opponents, it becomes dead immediately. We can, I can't rip it out of his hands, right? It's done, over. All right. Right, so a, a four pass legal or illegal is incomplete and the ball is dead. It touched the ground. And there, I wonder, like, well, every four pass is dead to touch the ground. But I guess it's really talking about illegal four pass. Well, if I cross the line of scrimmage and I throw it forward, if it hits the ground, we can't consider it to be a fumble, right? Because it's 
he's not supposed to throw it because he's beyond the line of scrimmage. So I guess I don't know if it used to be considered a fumble, but it's not a fumble, right? If I throw it backwards, a backwards pass, that's a fumble. But if I throw a forward pass, be it legal or illegal, legal or illegal, if it touched the ground, it's dead. It's not considered to be a fumble. All right, if it goes out of bounds, obviously that makes sense. But the rule, I, I got to say it because it's in the rules. All right, a player possesses the ball in the air and first contact is on or outside the boundary or the boundary line. It didn't say live, put that in there, but boundary. Obviously, that makes sense. So some of those things y'all should know with experience, even though you might not have been reading the rules. Those two at the bottom, and all that makes sense, right? All right. Oh, I'm sorry. The last one there is if the pass is if the pass is legal and it's an incomplete pass, the ball returns back to the previous spot. Unless I don't know all the stuff in there, but it says unless it's fourth down in the right. so that's it, guys. Thank you for allowing me to finish rule seven. I know it's like 920.